<clears throat> well, friends, I'm so glad that the Lord has brought all of you here. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So in a soteriological sense, that's obviously the case. No one can come to Jesus for saving faith in a saving relationship unless the Father draws him. But I believe it goes even further than that, that no one can even come to church unless the Father draws that person to Jesus. And so the fact that you're here right now for Bible dessert on a Sunday afternoon means that the Father has drawn you here. Hallelujah. Let's stand and sing hymn number 664, Jesus is all the world to me. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without Him I would fall. When I am sad to Him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad. Sunshine and the rain, he sends the harvest golden rain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of rain, he's my friend. Jesus is all. Our text this afternoon is John's Gospel, chapter 6, and verses 49 to 58. A very difficult passage in John's Gospel. John 6, 49 to 58. Jesus says, Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. 
And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, as I said, this is a a difficult passage. Um, So difficult, in fact, that the people who heard it, many of Jesus' disciples, when they heard it in verses uh, 59 to 60, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And people began to leave Jesus, to walk away from Jesus because he taught what we just read. Over the last few weeks, we've taken a close look at Jesus' dialogue with the crowd who had eaten of the multiplied loaves and fish just one day before. This crowd had followed Jesus to the other side of the Sea of Galilee because they wanted to get another meal from him. But Jesus, knowing the intentions of the heart, instead tells them of better bread. He does not Give them another feast of bread and fish as he did the day before. He points them to heavenly bread, which came down out of heaven and gives life to the world, even himself. And the crowd's response to that was to grumble about him, just as their fathers did in the wilderness of Zin, in the Exodus, when God provided manna to them and the people rejected it. Of course, if you remember... When the Lord used Moses to bring the people through the Red Sea, then they were in the wilderness. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. They did not have food to eat, so God sent miraculous food that came down out of the sky, landed on the ground, and each day the people could go and pick up this stuff called manna. Manna just means, what is it? That's what the word means, and And as the people went outside of their tents, they saw this flaky sort of substance on the ground that tasted like honey and coriander seed, a kind of a wafer that they could cook or bake or make into various different, you know, banana bread and different things. Um, And that was what sustained them. It sustained the people for 40 years in the desert. It had every vitamin and mineral that they needed to survive. It was all that they needed. God sent this bread. And yet, even though the people ate miraculous bread that came down from heaven, they still died. Because that bread was not an end in itself. It pointed to something greater, to the true bread, Jesus said, which comes down from heaven in himself. And so even though the manna was God's marvelous and miraculous provision to the Israelites in their time of need, even then the people rejected that and they grumbled about it and they grumbled against God and they said, give us flesh to eat. We remember all the garlic and the onions and the leeks. It wasn't too bad in the land of Egypt. Making bricks without straw. Every day getting whipped. And so what happened? The Lord brought quail and the people ate of the quail until it was coming out of their nose, coming out of their orifices. They said, okay, enough of this. God went back and gave them more manna. And 
Many of the people were destroyed because they grumbled about it. Just as these people in our text in John 6 were grumbling about Jesus. And Jesus tells them, stop grumbling among yourselves. Well, in today's text, Jesus goes further than just calling himself the living bread. He says, if you don't eat this bread, you have no life in you. If you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And you may only receive eternal life by eating my flesh and drinking my blood. And he compares the manna in the wilderness with himself, who is far greater than that and who is standing right in front of the people. And oh, the manna was God's good gift. It did not impart eternal life on the eaters. In fact, the reality is that the whole generation of people who ate the manna in the wilderness, minus just a few people, that whole generation died in the wilderness and never actually entered into the promised land. But that manna was a shadow of the true bread. So Jesus explains the difference between what the Israelites in the desert received and the one who is now standing in front of them offering something far better. Here in our text, he shows us that who he is and what he offers is greater than a whole lifetime of worldly provision. Even greater than a whole lifetime of worldly provision provided in miraculous ways. He's better than all of those benefits. As wonderful as the manna in the desert was, the people who ate it still died. They consumed miracle food, but the wages of sin still took their due. The manna was useful for a time in sustaining physical life, but even consuming that could not prevent death. Yet in verse 50, Jesus says, This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus says that one must eat of his flesh in order to live forever. This eating, of course, must be of a different nature than the sort of eating that took place in the desert. This eating is spiritual. He is not telling his people to become cannibals. This eating is spiritual in the same way that the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 was offered living water. How did she drink of it? It was of a different nature than the water which was in Jacob's well. It was spiritual water. This is spiritual food. He compares his flesh to living bread. Bread sustains the body for a time, but this living bread of Christ, Jesus says, both gives and sustains life in the soul forever. And that he gives this bread for the life of the world, offering it on the cross to all who come to him by faith. Well, we're going to get into now, what does this mean? People, as they heard Jesus saying, you must eat my flesh in order to live forever. If you don't eat my flesh, you have no life in you. The people began to argue among themselves. Look at verse 52 to 55. They began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Well, true to form, many of those who heard Christ misunderstood him. Jesus was clearly speaking of spiritual consumption, and we know this. How do we know it? Because his disciples never took a bite out of Jesus. All right? That's how we know it. Jesus never offered his arm up to John and said, take a bite out of my arm, John. That never happened. All right? So even his closest disciples never 
bit Jesus, and yet they also were partakers of eternal life. Now, when I was at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and doing my second master's, I had to write a, a master's thesis. I was in church history, I had to write a master's thesis, and so I decided that my topic was going to be uh, Thomas Aquinas' view of the Eucharist as opposed to John Calvin's view of the Eucharist. And how did the Lord's Supper, um, how did the understanding of the Lord's Supper change between the time of Thomas Aquinas in the 12th century and then Calvin in the 16th century? Sadly, um, as I learned in researching that subject, the Roman Church embraced a truly awful position called transubstantiation. And they take what Christ says here to be the ultimate proof that though he says, uh, you have to eat my bread, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood, they would say the way that you do that is through the Eucharistic consumption of the real body and real blood of Jesus, that once the elements of the bread and wine are consecrated by the priest, those things literally and actually become the real body and blood of Jesus and are able in the eating of it to impart grace to the eater. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. The Roman church embraced that, still embraces that same kind of misunderstanding of Christ's words here by attempting to answer the crowd's question, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And they answer it by pointing to the Eucharist and claiming that that is how Christ gives his flesh to eat. Now this needs some explaining because there are still today almost a billion people in the world who believe in the false doctrine of transubstantiation, which was popularized by Aquinas in the 12th century. In Aquinas's mystical hymn, Pange Lingua Gloriosi Corpus Mysterium, which means, sing my tongue, the Savior's glory, of his flesh the mystery sing. Aquinas wrote this hymn. This is what he says in the hymn. Word made flesh by word he maketh, very bread his flesh to be. Man in wine, Christ's blood partaketh. And if his senses fail to see, faith alone the true heart waketh to behold the mystery. See what he's saying there? He's making this argument that the bread and the wine magically, mysteriously becomes the body and blood of Jesus. The sort of view is typical of what Aquinas would come to teach systematically about the nature of the Lord's Supper. And though Thomas Aquinas has some good things to say about other areas of theology, in this area he falls very short, wickedly short. And, uh, man, even, even just for this point alone, the damage that this doctrine, though Aquinas is not the inventor of transubstantiation, he is the popularizer of it. Him doing that alone is almost reason to throw him out entirely. It's almost reason to throw him out entirely. This wicked doctrine, this idolatrous doctrine of transubstantiation has led to the actual physical deaths of many Christians throughout the centuries. The Catholic Church and its official catechism wholeheartedly embrace this doctrine that the bread and wine of the Eucharist become the body and blood of Jesus, and history is rife with the tragic results of the Catholic Church holding this doctrine to the death, which is the reason why many of the later English reformers like John Cooper and Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer and Roland Taylor and the Anglican Archbishop Thomas Cranmer were burned at the stake under the Catholic Queen Mary of Tudor because she tried to force them to teach that transubstantiation is true. And when they said, we will not do it, 
They were burned alive. Under the threat of torture and that horrible death, Thomas Cranmer signed a recantation. He recanted of speaking against transubstantiation. And you know what they did to him? They sentenced him to burn anyway. I mean, how wicked can you get, right? And he realized his folly, and as they lit the fire, he asked for one of his hands to be free so that he could put the hand that signed his recantation into the fire. And say, he said, let this burn first, that which I signed that with. This belief in transubstantiation is carried over into the modern times within the Catholic faith. And, and I, I do want to say that, just as an aside, I truly do believe that it is only a lack of political power that prevents people from burning today for not uh, embracing this doctrine. It is only that reason. It's only for lack of political power. It's not because the, the Roman church's doctrine has changed. It has not changed. It has not changed. In the catechism today, it is the same. In fact, in the Catholic catechism, it reads this, by the consecration, the, tra the transubstantiation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ is brought about. Under the consecrated species of bread and wine, Christ himself, living and glorious, is present in a true, real, and substantial manner. His body and his blood with his soul and his divinity. Thus then, listen now, this sermon that I'm giving here on this text is not a missive against Catholicism, but because... This doctrine that Christ is teaching here has been so perverted and because a billion people in the world believe what I'm about to say, it's worth talking about for a moment. It's worth it. It's no surprise. Listen, you may not know this. If you don't have a Catholic history like I do, my mother was uh, an Irish Catholic, my father he was Jewish and grew up as a cashew, Catholic Jew, all right? And so I would go in on Christmas Eve at midnight mass with my mother. And I'd watch the Catholics come in, walk down the aisle. And do you know what they do before they go into the pew to sit down? They take a knee. They bow their knee and they do the sign of the cross. Do you know what that's called? It's called genuflecting. Why, though? I never knew why. Why do Catholics bow the knee? What are they bowing the knee to? Well, we're going to get to that in a moment. Catholics actually worship the consecrated wafer, whether they individually recognize it as such or not. Paragraph 893 in the Catholic Catechism says this, The Eucharist is the center of the life of of the particular church. What a profound difference there is then between Catholics and Protestants on this matter. While Protestants might say that the preaching of the word is the center of the life of the particular church, for Roman Catholics, the Eucharist is everything. To them, it is how Christ is literally manifest in the flesh, and he is sacrificed all over again every time the priest consecrates the elements. And they partake in them. Paragraph 1366 of the Catholic Catechism states in part, the Eucharist is thus a sacrifice because it represents the sacrifice of the cross of the cross. It is a memorial and it applies its fruit. They say that this Eucharist applies the fruit of the cross to the one who partakes in it. This doctrine is so embraced and the promulgation of it is so widespread that even the modern Catholic encyclopedia says this. Let us carefully select teachers who endeavor to implant the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas in the minds of students and set forth clearly his solidly 
uh, his, his solidity and excellence over others. Let the universities already founded or to be founded by you illustrate and defend the doctrine of transubstantiation and use it for the refutation of prevailing errors. That's what the encyclopedia, the Catholic encyclopedia says. The nature, then, of corporate worship in this tradition means coming together to literally meet with the Lord and see the Lord and even eat the Lord. This is the reason that Catholic people genuflect before sitting down in the pew. They are bowing and worship before the consecrated host. Because you just think about that for a moment. If you truly believe that the bread turns into the literal, actual body of Christ, that the wine turns into the literal, actual blood of Christ, well then, you must worship it. You must worship it. If that's Jesus, when Jesus is worthy of your worship. So then, the genuflecting is actually bowing the knee. Every knee shall bow. It is bowing the knee. But it's not really bowing the knee to Jesus. It's bowing the knee to something else, isn't it? Hmm. It it shows something else. Just last week, I was visiting my friend Matt and Magda's art studio. We were shooting a movie there, and and as we were um, driving home, I wanted to um, explain to my family and, and show them this treasury of the merits of the saints that the Queen of All Saints Basilica has in its front foyer. On Devon Avenue, there's this giant church called the Queen of All Saints Basilica. It's a beautiful, ornate building. And if you go into the front foyer of that building, there's this room off to the left that, <laughs> that has all of these relics in glass cases that are locked up inside of it. Do you know what's there? You know, I have pictures of it. I took pictures of it. They have a piece of the purple robe of Jesus. They have a piece of the true cross of Christ. They have a piece of Jesus' crib. Right? They have a piece of the sponge of Jesus. Sponge that supposedly wiped off his brow as he was carrying the cross. They have a kidney stone from St. Augustine. <laughs> all right. They have all of these things that are there, right there, for the purposes and objects of worship. Why are they there? Why is the building so ornate, it's so beautiful? You know, uh, after the Protestant Reformation, church buildings typically became less ornate and less outwardly beautiful. Why? Why is it that... Catholic cathedrals are so ornate. Well, the reason why is because they're modeling themselves after a, a sort of a temple in the sense that when the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies in the temple on Yom Kippur, he would offer a sacrifice on the altar and literally be in the presence of God. There is a parallel with that sort of imagery here in the Catholic worship service when they go to church and approach the altar, they believe that they are literally meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ face to face in the Eucharist. Um, even the priestly vestments contain a parallel with the Urim and Thummim worn by the high priest as he met with God. And there's great care in taking and handling the Eucharist during corporate worship. Many parishioners refuse to even touch it with their hands. And so as they go up to take communion, you know what they'll do? Open their mouth and let the priest put the elements of the Eucharist in their own mouths. Lest it be defiled. The entire service is focused around the Eucharistic worship. Instead of the preaching of the word. One could say that Catholicism is actually primarily a Eucharistic religion. And in contrast to this, since we do not venerate or worship the Eucharist, our purpose in corporate worship is much different. Jesus was telling his disciples to eat his words, not literally his flesh, his physical flesh and blood. Those in the vein of the Reformers' views on the Lord's Supper do not come to corporately worship the bread and wine of communion 
but rather to hear what the Spirit says to the churches through the Scriptures and thus worship God in spirit and in truth. And that's the reason why, as the later Puritans understood this, in their churches, the pulpit was what was lifted high. The pulpit was lifted high. There were no decorations in the sanctuary or ornate glass on the windows. Corporate Protestant worship focuses on what the word was uh, as, as well, uh, what the word as well as the ordinances point to, namely the Lord Jesus Christ, who currently sits with his Father in glory. And I just want to say one more thing. I know that it might feel like I'm belaboring this point. Maybe I am. I just think it's, it's an important thing since Christ is actually saying in our text, and we're going to get to what I believe the true meaning of the text is in a moment. But I think it's important to see what it is not. It is not what I just described. It is not the Eucharistic religion of the Roman Catholics. It's not true worship. Um, there's more problems for it than just what I've mentioned. I mean, it, it this idea of Christ being physically present in the bread and in the wine, actually physically present, it utterly negates the parousia, the return of Christ. Because we know when Christ is coming back, he's not coming back every day when the priest does the mass. He's not coming back then. When Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, what does the angel say to the disciples? He will come back in the same manner in which he went up. He will come back on the clouds of heaven, not in the Eucharistic service, you see. And so what is taking place there in those sorts of uh, uh, services is no different from the forbidden setting up of an idolatrous image in the Ten Commandments. Um, Mass in the local church is the same thing as the valley beneath Mount Sinai where the people worship the golden calf that the priest Aaron made and consecrated. When the Israelites saw the golden calf in Exodus 32.4, they exclaimed, These are your gods, O Israel. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Aaron does not tell the people, This is Baal. As he makes the golden calf. He doesn't say this is Asherah and worship Asherah. He says here this golden calf is Yahweh. He's the one who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Worship the golden calf. Do you see the exact one to one parallel then? Between that and what is happening when those the largest segment of what calls itself the Christian church in the whole world, when they have their mass, they're doing the exact same thing, exactly the same. As the priest breaks the bread and consecrates the wine, he says, here is Jesus. Worship him. Here he is. He's in my hand right now. You have to worship it. It's a golden calf. It's idolatry. Those who question, you know, why would the reformers, why would Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley back to back being uh, on the stake? And Latimer says, take comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man, for we shall this day light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. Why are they willing to die and burn for that? And, and you know, the history tells us when they lit that fire, uh, Latimer went right away. He was an old man. He was in his 80s. And the wind was blowing toward Ridley. And so the flames were just burning his legs. And he was there for a long time with the flames just burning his legs, suffering, being tortured, until someone in the crowd came up and took a bag of gunpowder and put it around Ridley's neck so that when the flames reached the gunpowder, it would finally go up and he would die. Why were they willing? Why were they willing to die such horrific deaths? Because they saw that for what it was. They said, we will not commit the sin of idolatry. We will not worship. And we will not teach our people to worship bread and wine as though it is Christ. Absolutely not. 
It's a heinous, horrible sin. And, you know, I just wonder today if we even think about that at all. Would we be willing to take such a stand? To reduce the Lord of glory and his sacrificial work to bread kneaded by human hands or wine whose grapes were picked by farmers is the height of heresy and idolatry and evil. And worship of God was never to be directed toward anything but God and God's, and God became incarnate only once. He became incarnate only once in the person of the Lord Jesus of Nazareth. Very well. All right. I'm done talking about that right now. I hope I've set that up so that you, you know, never go back to Rome. It's tragic that we've seen in the last 30, 40 years, even some so-called highly respected evangelical leaders return to Rome. You don't even know what they're returning to. They should have been taught better in their seminaries before they became leaders. Because when they go back to Rome, they're going straight back to that valley beneath Mount Sinai. That's where they're going. That's where they're going. Very well. So then, this should inform our understanding of Christ's words in our text today. The eating of Christ's flesh and the drinking of his blood is accomplished by believing in him. The crowd asked him, what must we do to do the works of God? Jesus answered them, the work of God is this, to believe in the one whom he has sent. The Samaritan woman drank the living water by believing in Christ. And we, friends, we eat his flesh and drink his blood in the same manner. Do not be confused when Jesus says in verse 55, My flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Listen now. The spiritual nature of the consumption of the flesh and blood of Jesus, the spiritual nature of those things makes them no less true. Just because it is a spiritual consumption, that doesn't mean it's not a true consumption. Just because he's speaking in a spiritual sense of consuming his flesh and dr drinking his blood, doesn't mean that his flesh and blood are not true food and true drink. For what is the function? Think about it this way. What is the function of food? And what is the function of drink? Like actual food and drink that you eat. What does it do? Well, it nourishes, it gives strength, it refreshes, it satisfies, it sustains our life. What then do the body and blood of Christ do? The same. The same. And more even. Christ nourishes us. Christ gives us strength. Christ refreshes us and satisfies us and sustains our life. Of course, it makes sense then that Jesus says that his flesh is true food and his blood is true drink. For in the giving of them, he brings life to the world. They function as food and drink do. Nourish, sustain, strengthen, give life to. That's what food does for us in this world. And so Christ is true food and true drink, though our receiving of him is spiritual. And living bread is a perfect descriptor of how his sacrifice functions for all who receive it. And then in verses 56 to 58, we see an added dual benefit of the mutual indwelling for all who partake in Christ. Look at verses 56 to 58. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who, drank, he who eats this bread will live forever. Do you see that? First, Jesus says this. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. What is that? That's justification. That's the benefit of justification. 
Augustus Toplady put it this way, rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be for sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. What does Christ say? He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. The one who consumes Christ's body and blood by faith abides in him. And thus we are declared righteous by God, who no longer sees our sins, but only his son. We abide in him. Not only that, the sentence doesn't end there. He says, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. And what else does he say? And I in him. What's that? That's the benefit of sanctification. The life of God in the soul of man. There's a wonderful book written by Henry Skugel in the 19th century. The life of God in the soul of man. Funny enough, I, I actually read that up in Mundelein. There's this, <laughs> there's this like ca Catholic retreat center up there in Mundelein and there's there's like an area and they have this beautiful lake and you can sit there by the lake and and just read and I went up there to to do that and, and I read the entire book you can read it in one day I read the entire book the life of God and the soul of man by Henry Skugel who died at the age of 28 years old man it's amazing he had such profound spiritual insight at such a young age that book profoundly impacted me. And Christ says that through the partaking of his body and blood, we live in him and he lives in us. He abides in every believer. He empowers us to live for God. Later on in this same gospel, Jesus gives another analogy of a vine in branches. He says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We abide in Christ by the eating, the consuming of his body and blood. So still there's something that nags me. Do you feel it too? How do we eat it? What does it mean? Well, I think Paul illuminates that for us. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me and the life which I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So then, Paul says that this very same benefit, the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me, gave himself for me. He lives in me, he says. How does he live in me? By faith he lives in me. So this consuming of the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ is a consuming through faith. It is simply the taking in of Christ. It is the receiving of Christ. To those who receive him, he gave the right to become the sons of God. What is eating but receiving? It's just another analogy that Christ is giving here. He's giving this analogy of receiving him, believing him. What was this people's problem? This people that he was talking to. Remember the context in which he's saying this. Jesus had the day before done so many wonderful miracles. John's gospel does not record them all, but the other gospels do. It says that Jesus went up on the mountain and he was teaching the people and he was healing all sorts of infirmities. And the people were bringing their sick to Jesus. They saw with their own eyes the miraculous signs that he was doing. And then he does this thing. Even other miracle workers in history have done 
stupendous things, marvelous m miracles. Elijah raises a boy in 1 Kings 17. Elisha does miracles. Moses does miracles. Joshua does miraculous things. No one ever in history ever took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed a gigantic multitude of people. No one ever did that, ever. That's a miracle which solely belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. He did that. And earlier on in this chapter, I just want to show you this here. Um, look at verse 14, John 6, 14. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. When did they say that? When they saw the sign, right? They saw the sign. The text says when they saw the sign, they said, this is the prophet who was to come into the world. And then when they found Jesus the very next day, what did they say to him? What sign are you going to do so that we may believe in you? <laughs> what? What? Jesus is here displaying for them their main problem. They were willing to receive all of his benefits. They were willing to receive the physical bread and, and the fish that came from his hands. They were willing to receive that all day long. All of Christ's benefits they were willing to receive. They were not willing to receive him. He's the living bread. He's the source of life. They came to him with wrong motives. He even exposes their motives. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you did not come to me because you saw these signs. That is that you saw the sign of who I am through the miracles that I did. That's not the reason you're following me. It's because you ate your fill. Jesus, who knows the heart, said that to them. So it all makes sense then why Jesus is saying here in this context, in this chapter, why he's saying, I'm the bread. Don't you understand that? You're seeking bread. You're seeking the wrong bread. I'm the bread. I'm the one that's able to sustain you. I'm the one that's able to give you life. Come to me by faith. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. I believe that what Christ says here functions in the same way as the parables function. Though it is true when he says, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Of course, because that's the function that they carry out. They sustain us. He, 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 he gives us life through himself. But it acts as a kind of a parable. The reason that he speaks in parables is so that they may be ever seeing and never perceiving. Ever hearing and never understanding. And this hard teaching by Christ, what does it do? What's the function of that? It separates the true followers of Christ from those who are following only because of his benefits. It separates them. Because what happens right after, we'll take a look at this next week, Lord willing, what happens right after, the disciples who are following him start to walk away from him after this. They start to walk away. It's too hard for them. They don't want to hear this kind of teaching. They don't want to hear it. Why are we seeking Christ? Why are we here right now? If we are here for merely the benefits of Christian fellowship, which is a good thing. Christian fellowship is a good thing. It really is. Singing is a good thing. It's really good. It's fun and it's good and it's happy and it's... And we, Get to participate in worship. 
All those things. It's, it's a good thing. It's good to sing to the Lord. I was talking about this earlier today in my morning sermon that a person can experience all of those benefits and really love them and come and be a part of the body of Christ because of the benefits of Christ and never actually know Christ. I think that that is what Hebrews 6 is referring to when the author of Hebrews talks about the one who has enjoyed the fellowship and the communion of the saints and the goodness of the word of God, that a person can come to a church and hear the preacher and be like, wow, a lot of that stuff that he's saying, I really agree with that stuff. Man, I really like it. I really agree with it. A preacher might say something, let's say, uh, about, I don't know, the political culture in the world today. And a person can come in and say, yes, yes, I agree with that thing. Totally. Things are getting darker. It is harder in the world. Uh, you know, or, or, or we have to make a stand against X, Y, or Z. Or they could come and say, I agree. I agree with all of those things. I agree with those things. And so they join in the corporate body of worship. And they really like the lunches that come afterward. And they really like the organ playing and the piano playing. And it's really sweet. And man, there's a lot of sweet people that are here that are way nicer than the people in the world that you see at work. These people here in, in the pews here, they're not going to make fun of me or say mean things about, at least not to my face. You know, they're, they're going to be like real nice. You can see how a person could find lots of wonderful benefits inside of the church. And say, I like that. I like those people. I want to hang out with those people. And still never receive Christ. Come for the food. We have great food afterward. That was the motivation of the people in John 6. They came for the food. Not for the creator. Not for the redeemer. We should examine ourselves. I think this is part of the reason why Paul tells us to examine ourselves. To see if we are really in the faith. What is our reason for Worshiping Christ, coming together, singing the songs, praying together. And it's why Martin Lloyd-Jones, I said it last time, I think, we, when we were together and we sang, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And I was listening to Lloyd-Jones preaching just the other day. And, and, uh, and Lloyd-Jones said this, I have some problem with some of these hymns. Part of the reason why I have the problem is because I think, do we really mean it? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The person who says that, do they really mean that? That, ah, oh, my tongue is not enough. I wish I had a thousand tongues to sing my Redeemer's praise. Do I really mean it? Because if I don't mean it and I'm singing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Yeah, whatever. Then you know what I'm actually doing? I'm taking the name of the Lord in vain. That's what I'm doing then. I'm breaking the commandment, taking the name of the Lord in vain. What is our purpose in following Jesus? Why are we here? What are we doing here? Is it to consume Christ? Can we say with Paul, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Can we say, that's what I want. Although I like the fellowship of sharing in a meal afterward, I want the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Whoa, we don't ever hear people say that, do we? I want to know the fellowship of sharing in Christ's sufferings. Wow! You don't ever find a church, and we should start a group here, Calvin. Well, we'll, we'll start a group here. Suffering for Jesus fellowship. <laughs> All right, I want to know. The fellowship of suffering for Christ. What's our purpose in coming to him? Are we receiving him? Are we eating him? Is he our focus? Not just his benefit? 
Notice here, as we close, and Jesus says in verse 57, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. Christ says that this is like a, a, a mystery of the Trinity. He says that his own life is because of the Father, even though Jesus is co-equal with God the Father. He lives because of the Father. He had no beginning, but he is begotten. All right. And, and, and how, how we explain that, we need to always be extremely careful lest we fall into Trinitarian heresy. <laughs> right? Super careful. He lives, he says, because of the Father. He is begotten of the Father, yet co-equal with the Father. He lives forever. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He was not created, but he was begotten. And the life that he has because of the Father, whatever that word because means, I cannot dive into the depths of the Trinity and the eternality of Christ. But whatever that means, his life that he has because of the Father, he is willing to share that life with us. Look at what he says. I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will also live because of me. No one has access to eternal life outside of consuming Jesus Christ. You must consume him. You must eat his flesh and drink his blood by faith. And when we do so, we become sharers in the life of God, he bestows and grants his eternal life to us. That's the benefit of Christ. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we receive you. We do not wish to be as those who are ever seeing and never perceiving. Ever hearing and never understanding. We don't wish to be like that, Lord. We want to come to you and receive you. Whoever receives you has eternal life. Even so much as eating your flesh and drinking your blood, consuming Christ, that Christ would be our all in all, that he would be our bread and our drink, our sustenance, our living water, our light and our life. Oh Lord, even though these Words were so difficult that many people turned away from you. May each person here be able to say, we will never leave you, Lord. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I thank you so much for every soul that you've brought here today. Please help us to have you as our focus. That we might consume you with it. You might live in us and we in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What's the number, Carol? One forty seven? Oh, five forty seven. Let's stand together now. And sing hymn number 547. My Jesus, I love you. My 
Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. May God be with you all.